Hi. In the last few videos, we looked at a very simplified version of backpropagation. We looked at the basic properties of neural networks, and we are now going to look at what kind of inputs neural networks need and what kind of output can they give us. As you will see, they are very flexible algorithms, and this is going to help us in a variety of NLP tasks. So as a summary of what we're talking about in this video, neural networks, and in general, deep learning models, take vectors or sequences of vectors as their input. These have numbers in them, of course. Neural networks and deep learning models are language models in that they have some knowledge about the relationships between words and therefore some knowledge about human language. For example, our n-grams were language models because they knew a little bit of if you have one word, the next word is coming up. Such a word is coming up. Neural networks can replicate these properties and as a matter of fact can uh, do this even like much better than n-grams. Neural networks produce outputs that can be classification. For example, tell you if, it's, if a spectrogram is the sound E or the sound I. They can also give you word vectors, um, embeddings, for example, or they can give, tell you, oh, you, the word you want is this one. This, this uh, makes it so that they're very flexible because they can give us the word that comes next in a sentence. They can give us the word that we are looking for in Wikipedia. They can give us the word in a second language. We give the word in English and we get the word in some other language, for example. They're very flexible algorithms. So let's look very quickly at what kind of input they need. We can provide it in several ways. One of them is to do encoding. In week five, we looked at a kind of encoding called ordinal encoding, where we gave each word a number. For example, hello might be word number zero, world might be word number one, I'm might be word number two. And then a sentence like hello world would be represented by a vector with two elements, the element zero and the element one. So you can see that if our vocabulary had 10,000 words and hello was the word 5,000, and this, one, this one's the word 6,000, then the vector would be 5,000, 6,000, if you had a large vocabulary. So it is just exchanging the word for a number. This is what we did in week five with ordinal encoding. There's other types of encoding. For example, one hot encoding is slightly different. Let's say you have a vocabulary of five words and only five words in your language. Hello world, I'm using Python. If you have a vocabulary of five words, then you could represent any word with a five element vector. And you could dedicate the zeroth element of that, of that vector to the word hello. So if you have a one on the zeroth element, this means that the word is hello. And if you have the word the zero in the zeroth element, it means that it's anything else. Uh, if you, in the second element, the element um, index one, the second element of the vector, you could dedicate that to the word world. So if you have a one there and zero in all the other positions, it could mean that you're talking about the word world, wor the word world, and not the other words. For example, in the last one, if you're talking about the word Python, we could dedicate the fifth position to the word Python so that you have one there and zero in all other positions. This is called one hot encoding. The same sentence, hello world, would be represented by a sequence of vectors. The first one of these would be one zero 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 for hello, and then a second one, zero one zero 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 for world. Why one in the second position? Because this is a position we have dedicated to world. This is one hot encoding. And again, if you have a vocabulary of 20,000 words, you would just have a vector of 20,000 fields and you would have a one for some for a word and then zero in every other position. A variant of these is called logit encoding. This is a form you will actually uh, bump into later in the class. This is very similar to the one hot encoding, 
but the numbers are not zeros and ones. They are, uh, they can be, for example, 0 0.8 and 0 0.5 if you only have hello world. So the larger value, 0 0.8, is the word, we, the word we're trying to represent. And the lower values are words that could have been possible, but are not really the ones we're looking for. So in this example, the word hello could be represented by the vector 0 0.8. 0 0.5 because 0 0.8 is the one that has the maximum number in it. There's a particular type of vector called the legit that's gone through a softmax function. A softmax makes it so that all of the internal elements um, add up to one. And so this makes it simulate probabilities because in probability everything needs to add up to one. So what this the softmax, softmax example is telling you is that there is a, for example, a 61% probability that the word you're looking for is hello, and a 38% probability that the word you're looking for is world. So this would tell you that hello is probably the world, the word you're looking for. This is one way that you can provide input to a neural network by having some vector that represents words, either by either by switching them with a number, or by dedicating a position of the vector. To the word and you could represent that position with a one a zero or a probability this would be encoding you can also provide embeddings and we've already studied these word to vec is a kind of word embedding you have a word and then you represent the word by weighing 200 features about its neighbors is is the word king a neighbor of the word kingdom of the word man of the word uh, royalty and so forth is the word woman a neighbor of the word kingdom man and so forth so by representing these neighboring words in vectors we get that word to vec vectors and many neural networks can use these embeddings as inputs because they're very rich they're a very rich way to represent each word We could also take spectrographic data. As we saw in one of our previous videos, if we have a sound wave, we can extract a lot of features from it. For example, uh, the frequencies with the highest energy, the volume or intensity, the pitch of your voice. And you could use these energy values as input to a neural network to, for example, classify a sound. Let's say you have uh, the formants, the, the energy, frequ uh, the frequencies, and the energy for a certain sound, and the neural network will give you what sound it is as the output, for example, ah. This is one way that you can provide uh, data to a neural network. Another way, for example, would be to use video data. If you have sign language, for example, maybe what you have is the pixels of a picture. So if you have pixels, you could represent each point by uh, its numerical value in some color scale. For example, you could reduce it to grayscale, and this would return you a matrix of values where higher values like 255 are associated to the color white and lower values like zero are associated to the color black. So as you can see, this matrix is a numerical representation of this uh, grayscale picture. And if you have a color picture, for example, it would just be three matrices, one for the red, one for the RGB, one for the green, one for the blue. Uh, yes, the uh, color image would be the same, but in three with three different matrices. Another way that you could provide input as video would be by using a depth scanner or a three-dimensional scanner. For example, a Microsoft Kinect that comes with game consoles. These types of scanners can detect features on your face, for example, so they could detect your eyebrows, your eyes, your mouth, and then they will give you very rich information about which parts of your body are moving, the depth at which they are moving, and we could use this kind of input to a neural network to for example, translate from ASL into English. Uh, this is one way that we could use language for the neural network. 
So, so far we have the inputs. In the next video, we're going to talk about some possible outputs for a neural network.